Now, when Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come down from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands. That is, without washing. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat anything without thoroughly washing their hands, thus upholding the tradition of the elders. And they will not eat anything from the marketplace unless they have first thoroughly washed it. And they have many other traditions like this that they observe, the washing of cups and pots and bronze kettles. So when they came to Jesus, the Pharisees and the scribes said to him, <clears throat> Why do your disciples not observe the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Jesus said to them, Isaiah spoke well about you play actors, you hypocrites, for it is written, this people worships me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, substituting human precepts for doctrines. For in upholding your doctrines and your human traditions, you nullify the word of God. He said that you have a fine way of changing the word of God in order to fulfill your traditions. For Moses wrote, honor your father and mother, and whoever speaks ill of father and mother must surely die. But you say, according to the tradition of Korban, you say to your father or mother, that which would have gone to you is now korban, dedicated to God. When you do this, you do not provide for father or mother, thus making void the word of God for the sake of your traditions that you uphold. And you do many other things like this. Then calling the whole crowd together again, he said to them, listen to this and understand. There is nothing outside of a person that by going into them can make them unclean. Afterwards, when he had left the crowd and gone back into the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Do you still not have understanding? Do you not see that there's nothing from outside a person that by going into them can make them unclean? Because it enters not the heart, but through the stomach, and goes out through the sewer. By saying this, he declared all foods to be clean. He said to them, but it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions arise. Murder, theft, adultery, pride, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly, all these evil intentions come from within, and they are what make a person unclean. You ever notice that sign that's often in public restrooms? All employees must wash their hands before returning to work. Am I the only one who says, does that mean that I'm exempt? <laughs> I don't have to wash my hands. Now, what part of me gets hooked when I think that way? That I might not have to wash my hands today. It's not the adult part of me. I know there's good reasons for washing your hands before you go back to work. But there's a part of me that remembers the first or second, or maybe it was the third time that I took piano lessons, three times, never quite getting through the first year book. <laughs> One of the things that I remember as being a demotivator and it's interesting, of the piano teachers I had, she's the only one I remember, Miss Glasscock in Bloomsburg, Kentucky. When you went to your piano lesson, you couldn't go into the room where the piano was until she had supervised you going to the kitchen sink and washing your hands and drying them before you went into your lesson. And then after your half hour lesson, you had to march back to the kitchen sink and wash your hands again before you left. I wondered, what, how had I gotten my hands contaminated in there on that piano? <laughs> But as children especially, before we learned a whole lot about the importance of sanitation and public health, 
having to wash your hands seems to be this kind of an unnecessary interruption into activities you'd otherwise be focused upon. Well, as an adult, I gained an appreciation, of course, and working in settings like hospitals where I would work either going to visit people routinely as a pastor or times that I was a volunteer chaplain or a chaplain in training, it became second nature that as you entered the room, still do it. You hit the sanitizer and clean your hands. But it became something of vital importance this past summer when I traveled for the first time to a third world environment, if you will, or to a challenged part of the world. I've been to other parts of the world and I've been used to watching out about you know, what you ate and what kind of water you drank and that sort of thing. But even the people I went to India with this summer said, oh, we always get sick when we go to India. <laughs> <laughs> and so among the things they tell you is, wash your hands a lot. And don't eat anything that isn't fully cooked. Or if you eat anything, you know, fresh fruit, uh, don't eat it unless you washed it and cleaned it. And I can tell you the technique I learned for how you take the Clorox wipe and clean the outside of the banana peel and then with your other hand open it this way so that you're hopefully going to be pure when you eat the banana. So when Jesus seems to be getting after these Pharisees for talking about how they won't eat anything from the marketplace without first washing it, I say, and you got a problem with that? <laughs> <laughs> so our current sense of public health tells us that some of these things that were part of the law, that were upheld rigorously by the scribes and the Pharisees, made public health, made good sense. So why is Jesus all out of joint about this? Why is he taking them on so strongly on the issue that's the obvious point of controversy in today's story, and that's whether we're made unclean by what goes in us or what comes out of us, or the significance of the traditions of the elders that call for ritual hand washing, certain kinds of food, and many, many other things. But on the positive side, what kind of balance would the life of God's people have had had those traditions not been given and established? As Tevye the Milkman talks about life in the Russian village of Antetevye, Antetevye, tradition is important, is it not? A fiddler on the roof. Sounds great, eh? Okay. Well, in our little village of Antetka, you might say that all of us are like a fiddler on the roof, trying to scratch out a pleasant, simple melody without breaking our legs. <laughs> you may ask, why do we stay up there if it is so dangerous? Well, uh, we stay because Antetka is our home. <coughs> <laughs> Sing along, you who know this song, ready? when 
The young husband noticed that every time his wife would roast a ham, <laughs> this is kind of counterintuitive to tell a ham story right after. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Bobby was many years ago the chaplain, campus minister at Barton College, formerly Atlanta Christian College. In fact, back when it was still Atlanta Christian College, it hadn't become Barton College yet. There's no difference, please. Where I served in the community there as pastor. I'll never forget the story that Bobby tells about his days as the campus minister, chaplain, and that the person on campus that he went to as his spiritual guide most of the time wasn't one of the religion professors, wasn't anyone on the administrative staff, but was the chief custodian, a person of deep faith, a person who held a daily Bible study around the corner from his office and that he sat in on from time to time. The sincerity of his prayers he was touched by, the tenacity of the spiritual energy that he was inspired by. But what he always remembers and talks about was the greeting he got every day from this fellow. Because every time he'd see him, he'd say, hi, Mr. Bobby, How's your spirit? How's your spirit? Would we dare say that to each other as we greet one another? How's your spirit? But I tell you, you could help me a lot if you'd ask me that a lot of days. <laughs> because it would probably trigger me stopping and thinking for a minute. With everything I'm focused on, with everything I'm anxious about, with all the tasks that I think are high priority with the challenges of the day that we're facing, if we fall very far out of being closely attuned to that basic relationship with God, if we don't allow it to be fueled and generated by a consistent, tenacious life of prayer, attuned to God's presence, seeking God's will, how can we expect what comes out to have integrity or balance? How can we expect what we're living through and sorting through, what we'll be talking through and deciding in our home meetings in the coming weeks, what we in leadership of the church will be sorting through and living through in our major decisions about the direction of our ministry for the future. If that doesn't start with an awful lot of work in here, a lot more concern about are we cleaning up in here more than what are we cleaning up and deciding out there, then our journey can get misspent from its outset if we don't take care of it here. Well, the issues that were a point of tension between Jesus and the Pharisees seem somewhat superficial to us today. <clears throat> it's hard for us to relate entirely to how tradition of the elders and washing of hands are matters of critical importance. But there are other issues, scratches very deep, that do indicate what we mark as being acceptable or unacceptable, clean or unclean. I still remember the Sunday when youth group from a former church was on the way to a mission trip and stayed at the church where I was serving in that same community in North Carolina. Slept overnight, typical to sleep over where they weren't with the benefit of showers or beds or that sort of thing, but we provided the coffee and floor and what hospitality we could. Next morning, they were going to stay for the worship service and sing a song in the worship service. And Tommy, who was the youth group sponsor, who's now a pastor in a church in Illinois who has a thriving ministry, was uh, acting like himself. And Tommy didn't always have good table manners, or he didn't back in those days especially. And he hadn't been able to shower, and he was having a bad hair day, so he kept the baseball cap on while they were in and working on the song. One of the members of the church pulled me aside, literally, red in the face, and I could see veins bulging. When he pulled me over and said, tell him to take that baseball hat off. He was wearing a baseball cap in the sanctuary. Now, Tommy, fortunately, he had a spiritual maturity when I explained the situation to him. He took the cap off and wasn't going to appear to be there. But in the background, I could hear Jesus saying, for the sake of the traditions that you're holding, you turn away from the call of God. Well, I don't have an issue with hand washing or with baseball caps, but I'm here to tell you that it's taken me a while to get over a mental block about tattoos. <laughs> when one of our daughters on a phone call home happened to say, I'm getting a gift for myself, and then she started to describe the tattoo she was going to get. I said, well, back when they were home and we thought we could do something about this, you know, maybe we have a little more power in the situation. We're totally powerless in this one. <laughs> Other than to do the usual saying, do you really think you should be spending your money on that? Now, you probably... She's been here too, a couple of times since she's gotten the tattoo. You wouldn't know it necessarily. It's in the back of her neck, not in the back. You, know, you, you wouldn't 
wouldn't see it unless she's wearing a certain kind of blouse or dress or has her hair up or something like that. It's very tasteful tattoo. But am I the only one here in my world growing up? Tattoos were questionable at best. <laughs> but Jesus says, you're not defined or made unclean by what goes in, but what comes out. And more and more, as tattoos become more and more fashionable, are we being pressed? That's just one example. But why it's playing on me is, over the last few weeks, a tattooed lady preacher has been messing with my mind. <laughs> it started a couple of weeks ago at the NBS Festival gathering when my friend is a young Lutheran pastor who was the worship coordinator. Among a lot of media that he drew into the service, drew a portion of a sermon given by Nadia Bowles Weber, who is a Lutheran pastor, one of the strong voices in the emergent church movement, who, as she tells her story, and as she told the youth at the ELCA National Youth Gathering in New Orleans earlier this summer, moved from a rigid background in the Church of Christ, rejecting the church entirely because of its oppressive stance, going through a period of destructive living, alcoholism, and then a turn to recovery and sobriety in her early 20s, now 20 years clean and sober. Much later stage of that, that reconciliation with religion and with Christianity, in her case, it happened to draw her into the Lutheran church. And she is, as a pastor, a very traditional Lutheran who's got a bunch of tattoos, and who started a church in Denver with a core group of people who were not church people, but who were spiritually seeking and who needed the church and needed the pastor. They're four years old, they're up to 108 or 90 members now, and folks, they don't have a building, they use somebody else's church building for their services. <laughs> well, we won't go there. <laughs> Other than to say, she's playing with my mind because it keeps pressing up against some core challenges about what is fundamental about the faith and what is today's emergent world hearing and listening to, and what's clean and unclean so when I saw that segment of her presentation at the National Youth Gathering, an event that I happened to get the opportunity to experience 15 years ago, the last time it was in New Orleans, when a group from our Biblical Storytellers Network were there as part of the leadership, I can picture the scene, the Astrodome, 30,000 high schoolers hear this word from the tattooed lady preacher. When I was in seminary, I had, I think, the only pious thought I've had in my entire life, and it was this. I just want God to use me. And now I feel kind of used by God, honestly. Sometimes it doesn't feel good. But isn't that the miracle? Because you know what? Some of your parents and some of your pastors were really upset that I was your speaker tonight. They felt like I was somebody who should not be allowed to talk to tens of thousands of teenagers. And you know what I have to say to that? They are absolutely right. Somebody with my past of alcoholism and drug abuse and promiscuity and lying and stealing should not be allowed to talk to you. But you know what? Someone with my present, who I am now, shouldn't be allowed to talk to you. Because I am a sarcastic, heavily tattooed, I swear like a truck driver. They're having a heart attack back there going, please help her not swear. I am a flawed person. I should not be allowed to be here talking to you, but you know what? That's the God we're dealing with, people.
in first century Palestine. This is a God who slipped into skin and walked among us full of grace and truth with sand between his toes and who ate with all the wrong people and kissed lepers and touched the unclean and spoke through thirsty women and hungry men and who from the cross did not even lift a finger to condemn the enemy but instead said, I would rather die than be in the sin accounting business anymore. Thank you. 